Hi, welcome to educator.com. This is the lesson on major themes in AP environmental science. So really there are six main themes and depending on which textbook you look in, uh, there's gonna be different kind of splitting up of these themes and how they're discussed. But uh, here's a good way to look at them. So the six major themes, number one, human population growth. Uh, this is something that continues to be an ongoing problem. As time goes on, uh, we have more and more people and more and more of those people are breeding and it could be an exponential growth over the next century. Um, even more increased growth than we've seen in, in the recent past. And that poses some problems. Sustainability and carrying capacity. So sustainability, um, how well can we maintain an environment in terms of using those resources and uh, use it in a way where we're not decimating the natural resources and we can retain the ability of that to actually provide uh, sustenance and the ability to live off of it. And along with that is carrying capacity. How many humans can the world actually accommodate? So if the carrying capacity of, of the earth is, let's say, 10 billion or 12 billion, uh, if we get to 12 billion and we seem fine, well, can we sustain ourselves at 12 billion? Or when we get to 12 billion, will that actually result in uh, the decimation of, of natural resources on earth permanently? Um, so the carrying capacity is something that is debatable in terms of what actually um, can be sustained here on Earth. Global solutions. The problems within the environment and, and, and using natural resources and the disadvantages of certain natural resources is not just a United States problem or a European problem or a South American problem or even a local problem. It really is a global um, concept. We're all connected. Nature exists on, on all of Earth's surface in the biosphere and we have to think of this as a global community uh, because if only one country is trying to solve the, the issues in environmental science and trying to, to come up with solutions, it doesn't help if everybody else is, is not on the same page in terms of trying to uh, uh, solve our problems. Urbanization. As time goes on, more and more people are living in cities and urban environments and, and there's less and less people living in what we would call rural areas. Um, that's an interesting uh, concept. As time goes on, the increasing size of cities and, and the denseness of that population poses some issues. Uh, people and nature, um, how we affect nature, how nature affects us. Uh, it's important to realize that even in an urban environment, that's still nature. Uh, we tend to think of it as something different, but we are just modifying nature and, and building structures in nature to suit our needs. And we have to think about potential consequences of, of doing that and, and, and having unchecked growth um, in urban environments, especially if we are using old technologies or technologies that are not efficient in that particular uh, setting. And then science and ethics. Um, are, is what we're doing an, an ethical choice? Um, what are our values? Um, is it about just sustaining human population? Uh, what about animal populations, plant populations? It's all connected. So in terms of how we deal with environmental issues from an ethical standpoint and what are those ethics based on, it's important to consider. Uh, I picked this photograph because it's really, you know, man-made structures meeting nature. Um, so a lot of people consider, you know, this, this curb and the asphalt here on the street to be, uh, you know, human zone and then beyond is nature. And like I said earlier, that's a misconception, at least from the environmental science perspective. And here is, is our home. That's the biosphere. Um, kind of beautiful to look at, huh? All right, so this first topic, human population growth. Um, there'll be more discussion of all of these topics in, in, in later lessons. So this is just an overview for the time being. The largest increase in human population on Earth began in the last half of the 20th century in the 1900s and continues through today, of course. It's not always been a steady increase. And of course, you can imagine, you know, why there's been a huge increase in the last you know, century or so. It's not just medicine. It's not just, um, you know, finding sanitary solutions or combating disease or, um, you know, figuring out how to solve malnutrition. There, there's a lot of uh, contributors to the reason why the population has increased so dramatically. You've probably seen um, this before somewhere. So on this y-axis is the number of people and on the x-axis is time. 
And, you know, this is, you know, way back, let's say a uh, thousand years ago, you know, we've got, you know, that amount of people and there's little rises and drops and there's, you know, eh, kind of steady. And then all of a sudden, boom, that's, you know, since the late 1900s up through now, um, it's it's kind of startling to see that because you're like, oh, where is this line going? Is is the slope going to continue to increase? Is it going to plateau? What's going to happen? And there have been instant instances in the past where there, you know, there've been drops. So uh, I was just approximating this, of course, I don't have this memorized or the exact numbers, but this drop here could be due to uh, Black Death in Europe, the, the Black Plague um, around the 1300s. Um, and there's been, you know, wars and there's been genocide and famine and, and it hasn't been a steady increase or, or a linear uh, growth. It's been, you know, kind of steady, uh, and, or, or sorry, kind of level is what I meant to say, until boom, it rose really dramatically um, in the last half of the last century. And of course, this rapid population growth directly affects the environment, the resources, what we need to sustain that amount of people and the increase in that number. And then the waste, the more people you have, the more waste there is. And I'm not just talking about, you know, fecal waste. I'm talking about um, everything we use, um, plastics, electronics, um, all, all that stuff we throw away. There's a drastic accumulation of waste and what we do with that waste is important to consider. And because of those reasons and others, it comes back to affect us. So we affect the environment, the environment affects us. We are communal, we're intertwined with nature. Famine and food crises have to do with this rapid population growth. And depending on what region you're in on earth, um, some regions because of you know, environmental reasons, um, the resources that are there, political reasons, um, the terrain, what kind of ecosystem you live in, it makes you more or less likely to have a famine or food crisis. So one of many examples is Africa. So in certain parts of Africa in the 1970s, we saw just crazy malnutrition and, and death. Um, in the 1970s, about 500,000 people starved to death in parts of Africa, and millions had malnutrition. Um, and, and it's not something where we can look at it, you know, from um, kind of a, a biased perspective or uninformed perspective and just assume, oh, you know, they just, they're not maintaining their environment. Uh, they don't know how to farm properly. Oh, they're a third world country over there. It's not as simple as that. There are lots of causes that resulted in millions of lives being negatively affected. Drought is one of them. So, Drought, if not dealt with properly, can lead to deaths of, of millions of people, potentially. Um, destruction of their natural habitat also contributed. And some of that is um, uh, political situations, rival factions, um, and, and, and as part of their warfare, destroying villages and destroying crops. And that's going to have a negative impact. That's going to lead to famine and death. So these two and, and other causes resulted um, in that major situation in the 1970s. And by the 1980s, people in the United States started to catch on, like, hey, this is a major problem. And, and there was more aid going into Africa from that point on. Um, it's not over yet. I mean, it's, it's, it's a continuous problem, and it's not just in Africa. Uh, food riots in 2007, 2008 in Mexico, Haiti, Egypt, India, and other countries, uh, there was violence uh, based on food shortage. And it's, it's not something that, that's simple. It does have a lot of um, contributing factors. One of them is the rising cost of basic items. For instance, uh, in some of these countries, crops that people were relying on for food, the government actually decided to use um, a fairly large proportion of those crops to make fuel and sell that fuel. That reduces the amount of food available when the supply is a lot smaller, that can make it more expensive. And for people who um, barely have enough money you know, to support their family, uh, the rising cost of food can be a, a major hardship. Um, so, so these are the topics that come up as a result of unchecked human population growth on Earth. Sustainability and carrying capacity. So the objective, one of the major objectives that we talk about in environmental science is sustainability. Um, using the environment in a responsible way where we can actually um, not run out of our resources and provide enough 
for future generations to also be successful. So this has a lot to do with resources. And when it comes to using particular fossil fuels, um, whether it's petroleum or coal, using that continuously with an increased population growth around the world, that's not sustainable. There's a limited supply of that available. So trying to gradually shift into those sustainable resources is something that is discussed in environmental science. Sustainability of ecosystems. So whether you live in uh, Los Angeles or uh, the African savanna or in the rainforest of Southeast Asia, um, you are a part of an ecosystem. And ecosystems, we sometimes refer to those as the various biomes. So as I was suggesting, regardless of where you live, um, it's important to sustain our environment. Uh, we don't want to permanently damage the ecosystem that we're a part of because we're just greedily taking from the environment and not thinking about, is this a responsible way uh, to sustain what's around us? So the goal, yeah, sustainable global economy is what we want to try to work on. Cooperate with other nations. Um, make it a profitable sustainability if we can. Population control. So um, population control is, is, is a tricky one because, you know, let's say you're in the United States and you want to do something about um, controlling population growth in, in a poorer country, like let's say a third world country uh, that's in Africa or that's in um, Central America or in, in part of Southeast Asia. The trouble is it's not just about people um, making more people. What are the causes of, of what it is that, that contributes to this country having a huge population growth, a, a huge increase that's unchecked, and another uh, country having kind of a steady uh, population number? Well, one of them is literacy. There's usually an inverse relationship between how literate a country is and how many people they're making. Uh, with education and literacy being brought to uh, countries that have this unchecked huge population growth, oftentimes we see them taking more responsible steps to um, perhaps using contraception and, and you know, still um, being able to live a life that, that they're used to, but doing their part to contribute to like not having more and more and more and more people. And in terms of resources, it's something to consider. Because if you have unchecked population growth in a country uh, with limited um, uh, resources, you're going to have a problem. It's not going to be sustainable. Uh, so providing literacy and education to some of those countries is going to help. Um, restructure energy programs. So what's not sustainable is having dependence on fossil fuels. Um, if we keep depending on fossil fuels in the near future, that's going to pose a problem. Not just because of how we're affecting the environment, but that's not a renewable resource. Um, economic planning, giving incentives to companies, whether it's uh, tax breaks or um, giving some other incentive to use solar, uh, wind power, water power, those things that are renewable. That's an important step. Social, legal, political controls. Um, governments can step in and, and help initiate some of these changes. And it's not gonna be easy. There are gonna be um, some growing pains in terms of making transitions to renewable resources. Uh, but we've seen countries uh, do this. We've seen countries, especially some countries in Central and Northern Europe, who've led the way in uh, wind power, in solar power, and doing a lot of good and, and actually making it something that is, uh, has economic benefits. Carrying capacity. So when it comes to carrying capacity on Earth, like I suggested earlier, it's debatable how many people uh, the Earth can actually hold and, and accommodate. This is a graph that has a lot to do with carrying capacity here. You know, T is time, N means number of people or number of organisms, and K, this is this imaginary line that can be referred to as the carrying capacity. And this is a logistic growth curve. You're going to hear more about that in a future chapter. Um, we've seen the human population growth actually rise exponentially. But this is uh, where you actually do have um, a lessening of, of growth, uh, plateauing off to where it's uh, kind of this, this steady amount of, of individuals. We'll see if we get there. Uh, it would be nice if uh, the various countries around the world implemented policies or incentives for people to uh, not have increased population growth over time. Uh, because if it keeps happening, 
um, we're going to run into some trouble. Global issues and solutions. So uh, from a global perspective, um, we have to realize that the problems in terms of using the environment in, 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 in a way that's not sustainable and continue, continual use of uh, non-renewable resources, it is a global issue. It's not just, hey, this country needs to deal with it. No, this country and this country and these people and these people. So these are worldwide problems. When a country is spewing up wastes from fossil fuel usage into the atmosphere, that's not just their problem. That's the world's problem. We share the atmosphere. We share our oceans. They all run into each other. Um, rivers, whatever's put into rivers inevitably ends up in the oceans. That's not just Europe's problem or Africa's problem or Australia's problem. It's everybody's problem. So whether it's man-made problems or just the Earth's cycles over time in terms of, um, uh, you know, different uh, atmospheric changes or different water changes, temperature changes, whether it's man-made or otherwise, we have to deal with those as a global community. Then there's what's called the Gaia hypothesis. So Gaia, a mythological figure, uh, this is uh, a Greek depiction, uh, of, actually might be from, from after uh, ancient Greece, but this is someone's depiction of the Greek image, ancient Greek image of Gaia. So the Gaia hypothesis is from a British chemist, James Lovelock, and Lynn Margulis, an American biologist. They believe that life on Earth has actually changed Earth in, in the sense that it can continue to support life. And it's this um, kind of um, intertwined relationship that Earth has been changed by us and we continue to change Earth to support us. So that's an interesting hypothesis uh, that changed the way that people have kind of viewed our planet. Other planets, since we, we presume they don't have life on them, they haven't been changed in the way that Earth has been changed to sustain life. Um, how much it can sustain life, how much it can support life in the future based on how we treat the Earth, that's debatable. All right, urbanization. There has been a trend of moving into cities over the last century. So in first world countries, developed countries, 75% of people approximately live in cities and 25%, only a quarter, are in rural areas. So in the more developing countries, it tends to be less. 40% of people are still um, are, are living in cities, whereas 60% of people uh, are actually in those rural, non-urban areas. But that is changing. In developing countries, they tend to become more urbanized as time goes on if they uh, experience economic success and, and trade success. By 2008, more than half of all people on earth lived in cities. That's incredible to think about, that if you were to flip a coin, chances are uh, it's, it's, it's more than 50-50. Uh, you're going to uh, be born uh, in some kind of city area, or if not, you're gonna end up moving there. So it's more than just a coin flip. Um, it's more than half of all people uh, living in cities, and it continues to grow. Tokyo, as of this year, as of 2014, has the largest population in a single city, almost 14 million. Uh, by the time you watch this video, it could be over 14 million. And 38 million are in the metropolitan region of Tokyo. H here's what that means. Um, I live in Los Angeles. So let's say uh, we were to talk about Los Angeles as an actual city where we say, hey, this is Los Angeles. The population is somewhere between three and four million. But if you include the neighboring areas in what's known as the LA metropolitan region, so this would include areas like you know, Compton uh, and uh, Venice and Long Beach and places like that, the larger LA metropolitan region is well over 10 million people if we include all those neighboring areas. So yeah, if we include, you know, Tokyo beyond just the huge skyscrapers we see in the middle, uh, we're talking 38 million. That's a huge city. So there's this term mega city that has arisen in environmental science. Anytime a city is 10 million or more people, uh, we call that a mega city. So yes, this includes Los Angeles and New York and um, many other cities you've heard of around the world. By 2015, most mega cities will be in Asia. Uh, so Asia is experiencing a huge increase in people and, and developing countries having this increase in population and, and more and more people moving uh, to urban areas. Um, I've seen this interesting um, image on social media 
where um, someone takes an image of the earth and puts a circle around uh, China, India, and parts of Southeast Asia. And they say that more people live within that circle than outside of it, which is amazing to think about. And that does coincide with this data about uh, most of the mega cities being in Asia by 2015. All right, people in nature. So this does have to do with urbanization, of course, but whether you live in a rural area, suburban area, or urban area, your life is intertwined with nature. So people in nature have profound effects on each other. This is a common theme in environmental science, of course. But there are some misconceptions with how that works. A lot of people view it as organisms versus nature, like, you know, nature's rough, nature's unforgiving, and it's us versus the wild. Well, yeah, nature can be harsh, but that's just how it is with life on this planet. Um, organisms are going to die, whether that's uh, a natural disaster, uh, a famine, lack of food, uh, or whether it's being killed by another organism. But it's important to realize that every organism has its niche. This term niche comes up in uh, biological sciences, especially in biology. Um, a niche kind of like an ecological role, how an organism fits into the environment, uh, how it affects the environment, how it affects other organisms, what is it doing, what is it eating, what it, how, where does it live? So every organism has a niche, and part of that niche means you may be prey uh, to some predator. And yes, organisms, um, it might be easy to think of it as them versus nature, but every organism's life is directly related to, to nature and is in harmony, hopefully, with nature. Um, humans are a little bit different because a lot of our actions have resulted in a sort of unharmonious or some disharmony uh, uh, relationship with nature because we're using more than we probably should. And it's, it's hard to find other organisms that are using more resources than what they need. And we're definitely doing that. So it's not organisms versus nature. We have to think about how can we work with nature Nature is something that's out there. Oh, it's just out there and apart from us. That's definitely a misconception. Uh, take this image of, of a tractor and, and uh, you know, uh, modifying the land to support agriculture and, and the growing of crops. It's easy for a farmer to think, hey, this is my land. And out there, that's nature. Well, you know what? This farmer is modifying nature to suit his needs in terms of making a living and, and economic needs and and the needs of the community. And, and of course, selling that food to people, that's important. But it's not, it's not wise to think of this as being outside of nature. Because then you might think like, well, I can do what I want with my land and not foresee the consequences. Using certain pesticides or chemicals in here, that has an effect on nature because guess what? This is nature. So just thinking of land as being yours and everything outside of it as being other that can be dangerous. Same with living in a city. I live in a city and it's easy to think of the city as being outside of nature. But guess what? The air we breathe is continuous with what's in nature. Uh, the land we're on, that's nature. Sustainable environment and sustainable economy? Uh, we'll see if we can do it. I, I hope so. I hope that we can sustain the environment and make it so that people are also being able to profit off of that. Um, and I don't mean profit as like, you know, making billions and billions of dollars. I mean profit to sustain just an everyday person's life. Um, there may be some, some growing pains, like I suggested earlier, with making transitions away from fossil fuel usage, you know, exclusively using those things and going to those more uh, renewable resources. I hope that in the next few decades that the sustainable economy is, is a reality and that we can make it work. I chose this image because uh, this reminds me of one of my favorite rock and roll album covers, uh, Nevermind by Nirvana. You have, uh, instead of a baby here, an adult, you know, swimming through the water trying to get that dollar. Because what drives us, especially in a capitalistic society, is getting that dollar and making a profit. Hopefully we can intertwine these so that, um, you know, sustaining the environment and making a buck can coincide. Science and ethics. And this is the last major uh, topic that's dealt with in AP Environmental Science. Intellectual standards. So I'm going to list them for you. Here are the intellectual standards. In terms of making statements from a scientific point of view, and those statements being something we can rely on and actually think is, is valid, there's some things we have to take into account. Number one, clarity. 
Is the statement clear? Do we understand what's being said? That's pretty important. Another one. Accuracy. So, is the statement true? Um, can we verify uh, the data? You know, so if, if data is a part of making that statement in terms of being accurate, um, can another scientist do the same study and have the same uh, kinds of data that's accurate? We would hope so. Precision. Precision is a little bit different than accuracy. Precision is exactness. Um, and if you need a visual in terms of accuracy versus precision in a future lesson, I have a, an example that helps clarify that. But uh, precision is like how exact is this, uh, this statement in terms of the data that's, that's given to us or uh, the quality of what's being said or written. Relevance. If something is relevant, it pertains to what's going on. So the problems we have now, does this actually make a difference to uh, the task at hand? Next one, depth. So there are a lot of complexities in terms of making statements about, oh, this is a problem in the environment and here's how we're going to solve it. Have you considered how that solution is going to impact this neighborhood over here or impact this stream? or impact uh, the, the rocks on this mountainside? W will this change actually lead to erosion? So I'm just throwing out some random examples, but depth is something important to consider. We don't want a solution or a statement that's just on the surface of things. We wanna think about it in terms of the complex uh, world that we live in. Breadth. The breadth of it. So with the breadth of uh, a statement, have you considered other points of views, other ways of looking at it? Uh, is, this, is this a narrow kind of point of view in terms of how we're addressing the problem or trying to come up with a solution to the problem? So breadth is important. Next, logic. Is it based on evidence? Uh, is it based on fact? So this um, also has to do with you know, the, some of the topics up here like accuracy and, and, and precision, but, but logic is a little bit different. Um, being logical about something, about a statement you're making, we're not relying on emotions or relying on bias. Um, logic has to do with, with tackling it, you know, based on empirical evidence um, and, and, you know, using our brain power rather than, you know, how we emotionally feel about something uh, is important when making statements about environment. Significance. Is this important? I hope so. So significance regarding statements uh, really comes into play. And finally, fairness. So with fairness, when somebody's making a statement about how to solve a problem or a problem that's happening in the environment, do they have a vested interest? So this also relates to bias. Um, uh, you know, if somebody's like, hey, we need to solve this problem uh, by, you know, uh, using this company because they have the best solution. Well, is that is that person suggesting that? Is, are they a stockholder in that company? Do they have a family member that works in that company? So we want to have statements that are fair in terms of not being biased and coming up with uh, a, a solution that, that includes all of these intellectual standards, hopefully. Um, and that's the best way to to state uh, an issue to people, come up with a problem, or sorry, come up with a solution to the problem rather is what I meant to say. And, and that's the best way to really deal with it in terms of uh, coming up with an ethical solution to our, our issues in the environment. And related to all those comes the precautionary principle. So the precautionary principle states that, hey, if we have a sense that we are changing the environment in a negative way and we're impacting the environment that has the potential at least the potential to negatively affect us and our you know, future generations, we need to get on the solutions now. So this is about not waiting for like overwhelming evidence in terms of, you know, crazy heat worldwide, flooding worldwide, famine worldwide. Once we've reached that point, it's pretty much too late or almost too late. Um, 
precautionary principles like, hey, let's do something now. And, and this has been around for decades. So it's about being proactive rather than reactive. Um, you know, coming up with solutions to these issues, like I said, can have some economic benefits if they're dealt with in the right way. So rather than waiting for, in a sense, hell on earth to exist because we've damaged the environment past the point where we can recover, uh, it's, it's just better to be proactive rather than reactive to that. And so evidence leading to action. As time goes on, more and more evidence is being compiled about how humans are negatively impacting the environment. I think there is some debate, some valid, logical, accurate statements that can be made regarding how much humans are impacting the environment. But it's undoubtable at this point uh, that human action uh, on a global scale has altered the environment. Um, so as time goes on, more and more evidence, I hope, will lead more and more people and the next generation and the generation after to really act on this in a responsible way. Uh, justifications in terms of uh, making environmental changes and, 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 and doing these things to, to solve the environmental problems we have, there, there are many ways to justify it. So utilitarian uh, works in this way. Um, if it benefits individuals on a local scale and even broader than that, uh, that has to do with a utilitarian point of view. So think about it this way. Um, you know, someone who lives in Europe may think, What's the point of, uh, you know, keeping African lion populations at a certain level? I'm not impacted by uh, African lions. Well, on a global scale, uh, there can be some impacts felt if you really think about how African lions impact populations. And it's not just keeping their prey populations in check as being like one of those top predators, top carnivores. Think about it this way. Uh, the local people in that area of the African savanna they may get economic benefit out of having lions there. Every year, people go to Africa for these safari vacations, and they'd like to see African lions in the wild. If you think about it this way from a utilitarian perspective and just, you know, making life a little bit better for those people in that region, they may get financial benefit out of tourism. And if there's no lions left, if there's no elephants left, if there's no giraffes left, there'll be less incentive for people who've got the money to go to those areas to have that vacation and benefit those local populations. So that's an example of a utilitarian uh, point of view. Ecological justifications. Well, um, that's easy to think about because the ecological aspect is like, hey, uh, the environment being there and, and sustaining it and, and having it there, not only for us, but for future generations. So the ecological justification uh, just makes sense. Um, you can think of it as like enlightened self-interest. Um, I'd like to go, uh, you know, on a hike or a vacation and, and have the ecosystem there instead of just taking and taking and taking and not thinking about how we're impacting the environment. Aesthetic slash recreational justifications are similar uh, in the sense that uh, just the beauty of nature, retaining nature's beauty, um, if we just take from the environment and build and build and build and just destroy nature, it's not going to be as beautiful. Earth won't be as beautiful as, as what we remember. Um, and related to recreation, you know, going out in nature um, and enjoying the beauty um, is something that I think is, is, a, is a justification a lot of people can identify with. Uh, moral justifications. Uh, wrecking the environment impacts us in terms of, um, you know, uh, our future generations being able to survive and, and rely on the earth in a responsible way. Um, we're making it harder and harder for that to exist in the future. Um, but also it's, it's moral justifications in terms of thinking about other animals and other organisms uh, that they have sort of a, a right to live. Um, and I know that might sound strange because if you think about um, Darwinism, uh, a lot of people tend to, tend to believe that, oh, since we're on the top of the food chain, we get to do as we see fit. We get to use uh, the earth. Uh, it's, it's been given to us to do that. Well, if you use resources and kill organisms and destroy environments without thinking about, hey, what are we doing? How is this impacting us in the long term? That's not the moral way to approach it. Um, so animals do have a right to live. Are we killing them because we, we need them to sustain our lives? If not, then why are we doing it? Uh, and then cultural justifications. Uh, when we think about um, the reasons why our culture wants to 
um, you know, save this wetland or save this marsh or um, not make a dam here. We may have a certain culture in terms of how we approach the environment and, and that's how we do it. But other cultures around the world, though we may have similar values, culturally, they may not see eye to eye with us about, you know, here's why we need to save this river or why we need to not use this chemical. Um, so relaying that information and explaining the rationale, I think is important to, to inform people, but various people around the world are going to have cultural justifications for why they do the things they do related to the environment. Uh, I have some people here that remind me of, um, kind of approaching science in terms of, of ethics and, um, being logical about it and explaining this to people who may have more of an emotional reaction. Uh, here we have Francis Bacon, one of the founders of the Western scientific method as we use it today. Uh, very smart guy um, and, and beyond a scientist. Here we have Rachel Carson, uh, her book, Silent Spring, and other books um, from the 1960s on. Uh, she uh, really was uh, part of the reason there was a huge upstart in the environmental movement in the 1960s and beyond. So she's a major contributor to environmental science. And here we have Neil deGrasse Tyson, um, famous in intellectual and science circles for years. Uh, but these days, he's even more famous because of Twitter and because of a show that came out recently called Cosmos, a reboot of the Carl Sagan show. Um, so, you know, these are scientists from different times, different decades. But I'd like to think that um, because of their ethical and, 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 and moral fortitude, these people have, have helped. Uh, we're standing on the shoulders of giants. I love that expression because people from the past and people today are making it so that we can make right decisions regarding environmental science now and in the future. Thanks for watching Educator.com.